Got my good brother right here, you know, who's an advocate, and he says that you can be pro-black and did outside. Impossible. You cannot. Marriage is a business. When you get married, you commit your mind, your body, your body, your heart, your soul, mm. and your pocketbook, mm. your savings, your estate, your wealth. You commit that to that person you're married to. See, when you marry, you don't marry an individual. You marry into a race. Mm. You marry into a community. So I didn't just I didn't marry a Jewish woman. I married into Jewish society. I didn't marry an Asian woman. I married into an Asian family. There's no way <laughs> you can claim to love black people especially as a black man, knowing that only one out of every four black women will get married in her lifetime. We have the lowest female marriage rate in the country, 25%. That means 75% of black women will never ever know what it feels like to be proposed to. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Daily Wrap-Up Crew. No book of, but I go by the name of Eli. As always, we got Ace with us. Yes, yes, indeed. You know who it is. It's the only podcast that's relevant. We got Uma on the show. It's Black Excellence. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I, I respect that. Last but not least, we got Jew. What it do? I'm here with my crew, Dr. Uma, too. Mm -hmm. And if you don't like... Share, subscribe, 100 lashes for you. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Yo, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can't prepare. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, yo, y'all was brainstorming. You know what I'm saying? I had to. I had yeah. to. Man. I, had to. <laughs> I had to write today. You know what I'm saying? was pulling up. <laughs> Listen, man, we got special guests in the building. We got the prince of pan Africanism, King Kong consciousness. So, y'all know the man, man. Mm -hmm. Dr. Umar Johnson. Glad to be here, fellas. Thanks mm -hmm. for inviting me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And real quick, can you let the folks know that sleeping under a rock that might not know who you are? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Dr. Umar Ifatunde, certified school psychologist, doctor of clinical psychology, uh, founder of the National Independent Black Parent Association, uh, Team Pan-African, the International Movement for the Independence and Protection of African People. I'm probably most known for helping black parents uh, learn how to protect their children from the special education crisis in the ADHD to prison pipeline, author of two books, Psychoacademic Holocaust, the Special Education and ADHD Wars Against Black Boys, as well as Black Parent Advocate, The Art of War for Dealing with America's Public and Charter Schools. I'm also a Pan-Africanist, a Garveyite, uh, and I'm currently putting the finishing touches on the first school in American history to be funded exclusively by the African diaspora. And that is the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. If all goes well, we'll probably be having our community grand opening during Kwanzaa 2023. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, before we get into these topics, hey, you, you got to make sure we get an invite, man, so we can pull up. Oh, for, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into these topics, make sure you hit that like button, um, subscribe. If you are not already subscribed, join the YouTube membership, man. We got some exclusive behind the scene footage, access to early episodes. Um, and then cop the merch, man. Daily Rapper you know, Co. Yeah. Man. Make sure y'all go support. Listen, let me get to this first. Um, I ain't got no shirt for me. Oh, definitely we, do. We definitely got definitely shirt definitely for do. Like, you. Definitely do. Don't give me no bra. I, to oh, yeah. I told you. you see? Yeah, you did see. You I did. did. You know what I'm saying? You. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> Listen, get into this first topic, right? Um, I know you're very big with the Pan-African community. Um, what is your ultimate goal that you have in mind for the overall Pan-African community? Great question. The vision, the mission... The goal of Pan-Africanism is to unite all African people globally mm. into one unified and organized system through which we can protect ourselves politically, economically, socially, culturally, spiritually, academically, so forth and so on. So unity is the foundation and independence is the elevation. Mm. That's the goal of Pan-Africanism, to make sure African people are not dependent upon members of other races in order to protect our lifestyle, our culture, and most of all, the destiny of our children. Do for self mm. is the heart and soul of Pan-Africanism. So when we win, we will be in charge of our lives. We will control the banks. We will control the hospitals. We will control the criminal justice system. We will control the economy. We basically want a parallel world that is under our authority because whoever controls your institutions controls your life. 
Got you. So I, I, the big word that you that I heard was you know unity, right? So um, <clears throat> what is your overall thoughts? Obviously, we you, you can see that we have this gender war going on, mm -hmm. um, this diaspora war going on. Um, what, what's your thoughts on those overall wars that's going on within the uh, Pan African community? I would not be surprised if we learned 20, 30 years from now that the domestic gender war was inspired by the FBI, just as the FBI gave birth to COINTELPRO back in the 70s to dis and 60s to disrupt and destroy the credibility and success of black liberation movements, I could very well see where COINTELPRO or something similar to it Mm -hmm. could have also been invented to turn the black woman against the black man and the black man against the black woman. If you look at this, it looks just like COINTELPRO, except it's not Stokely Carmichael fighting Huey P. Newton. It's not Dr. King, you know, and Malcolm having differences. You understand? It's you and your baby's mother having differences. It's you and your fiance having mm -hmm. differences. It's you and your wife having differences. And the family is an institution. No different than SNCC. No different than CORE. No different than the Panthers. No different than the Garvey movement. No different than the Freedom Riders. So I'm keeping an eye on it, but I really do believe that at some point we're going to find out that the U.S. government had a hand in the gender wars and the promotion of it. Because I don't think it's a coincidence that this black male versus black female gender war is being initiated at the very same time that the U.S. government is pushing transgenderism on elementary black public school children. Mm. So is that a coincidence that while you're trying to disintegrate the black family through non-traditional forms of life, uh, through black on black crime, through police genocide, through uh, poor nutrition, poor health care, all these weapons, uh, the snow bunny crisis, uh, 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 along with that, you see so many commercials now where it's the black man with the white woman or the black woman with the white man. Mm -hmm. Clearly, there's an agenda to brainwash our children into either being with someone of the same sex or someone of an of another race. And I think the gender wars coming at this time plays into the hand of the government's agenda to destroy the black community. On the other side, when we look at the uh, diaspora wars, mm -hmm. I think that's a CIA in inspired situation. Mm. You know, I wouldn't. One is within the, the states and another. Yeah, one is FBI international. Okay. doesn't have a charter to operate internationally. So if you want to disrupt locally, it's the FBI. CIA has no charter to operate domestically. Mm. So when the CIA interrupts, it's internationally. So the CIA is outside of America, FBI is inside of America. If you're a Pan Africanist like the Honorable Marcus Garvey, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, you're a Pan Africanist, you're automatically going to be watched by the FBI domestically mm. and the CIA internationally. Mm. And I think the uh, diaspora wars plays right into the hand of America's foreign policy initiatives. There was a security memorandum that came out, I think it was in the late 70s, early 80s, where the U.S. government in a private security memorandum that has now been published now said, the greatest threat to American foreign interests is what? The operational unity of Africans in America and Africans in Africa. This is the government. Our biggest threat is if we let the blacks on that side of the Atlantic Ocean you organize- this is a memo? This is a memo oh, it's a memo. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I could probably get you the numbers. It's not on the top of my head right now. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have even published it in books. It's definitely on the internet. Mm. Uh, people have referred to it. So they basically said, in essence, Pan-Africanism is our only problem. They don't care about nothing else. People pushing religions, people pushing socialism. They don't care about that. Pan-Africanism is the only threat to white supremacy. Mm. So... <laughs> That's crazy. So what would you say about, you know, obviously when we talk about the diaspora world, there is a sense of, um, you know, African people or Caribbean people using the word, well, I'm not black, you know what I mean? I'm Caribbean or I'm African or whatever mm -hmm. the case is. And they, they kind of associate negativity or negative stereotypes with black Americans per se. Mm -hmm. And they, they feel like they don't want to identify as black because black usually is the term that black Americans call themselves. So I don't want to be identified as black. So I am Caribbean. You know, it's like they're, they're separate people over there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So what's your thoughts on that whole, you know, that divide and just that whole blatant negative stereotype that some um, Africans or Caribbeans or other black um, black people feel towards black Americans. Well, the white man's original, the white man's original tactic of divide and conquer, separate and rule, is still his most cherished weapon against African people. Mm. You see, understandably, when people look at America up until now, being quote unquote the most powerful country in the world. If you want to get down with the most powerful country in the world, you're going to have to despise who they despise. 
And since America has done such a great job despising African people, anybody who wants to come to this country, even if they are African, are going to seek somebody else's company other than ours, mm. right? That doesn't make what they do right. But we have to look at the fact that we as African people in America haven't done a whole lot collectively to make ourselves the power base we should be for all African people. Mm. With our education, with our income, being the richest group of African people in the world in mm. terms of take-home pay, right. we should be the power base for African people throughout the world. Right. Y'all need institutions, we're going to fund them. Y'all have a problem with your water, we're going to fund that. Mm. You understand me? You got a medical crisis, we're going to take care of that. We have the resources, we got the personnel, we got the expertise, we got the money. We should be the power base. Mm. So when an African comes to America from outside of, the, outside of this country, they say, well, wait a minute now. If I align myself with the African-American, what is in that for me? Mm. Because I don't even see the African-American doing anything for themselves on a collective basis. Right. We have success, but it's all individual, mm. right? There's very few institutions that we run and control independently. Let's take it to Little League. When you go for the Little League uh, football team or the basketball team, do you go try out for the team that's losing every year? Or do you want to be on the championship team? Mm -hmm. Most mm -hmm. children want to be on the championship team. So when Africans from the diaspora come to America, they see two teams, the black team, that has lost 157 straight Super Bowls since the end of slavery, mm. right? And the white team that seemed like they still winning and doing great. I want to align myself with the white team. Now, the mistake mm. that Africans in the diaspora are making is that if you do not link up with us, your national homeland will never be free either. See, what they do to African people anywhere, they do to African people everywhere. Mm. So if you come from Nigeria, you come from Ghana, you come from Jamaica, you come from Turks and Caicos, <clears throat> you don't associate with African people, you go get you a snow bunny, move up on the west side, you can do all that. But understand, your life is only as sacred as white people allow it to be. At any minute, they can turn you into a Breonna Taylor, whether you have a U.S. passport or not. You've seen it happen here in New York City years ago with the Abner Louima and Amadou Diallo cases, where the police, you know, abused African immigrants right here in New York City. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to white people, we're all African. They know who we are. Mm -hmm. They, But they will use one group against the other as long as it is in their best interest. And once they're done using that group, guess what they do to that group? They destroy them too. It's no difference to looking at the black community to, compared to black celebrities. They, they used Bill Cosby as long as they could. Mm -hmm. And when they no longer needed him, they turned on him. Right. Mm -hmm. They'll use Whitney Houston as long as they could. When they no longer needed her, they murdered her. Michael Jackson, they murdered him. Prince, they murdered him. Jimi Hendrix, they murdered him. Kobe Bryant, they murdered him. You understand? So all of us are nothing but tools in the hand of white supremacy. We have to wake up from that nightmare, from that imaginary illusion of inclusion that has black people thinking, if I come to America, mm -hmm. but stay away from African Americans, I'll be given probationary white status. Mm -hmm. You'll never be given probationary white status because you are not white. And when they're done using you for your intellectual knowledge, when they're done using you in the labor market, when they're done using you helping to perpetuate the myth of a multicultural colorblind America, they'll bust you right back to the country you came from. Mm. All African people in America who are not practicing pan-Africanism are simply tools that are being used that have an expiration date. Mm. And when your utility to the white power structure expires, you will too, and they will send you back home. And this is why they hate blacks in America so much, the white power structure. Mm. We're the only non-white people in the country who cannot be sent home. Right. You cannot be deported. Slavery destroyed your cultural, psychological, and intellectual connection to your ancestral homeland. If the Ghanaian get on your nerves, he go back to Ghana. If the Puerto Rican gets on your nerves, he go back to Puerto Rico. If the Afro-Cuban gets on your nerves, he or she go back to Cuba, right? If the Chinese get on your nerves, send them back to China. If the East Indian gets on your nerves, send them back to India. If the Arab gets on your nerve, send them back to one of the Middle Eastern states. But when American Africans get on your nerves, where do you deport us to? Can't. You can't deport mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Slavery destroyed that connection that they needed in mm. order to remove us. Mm. Most American Africans are so brainwashed, they think they're American. So you cannot deport them because this is what they identify with most. So in other words, the white man created his own problem, which makes it almost impossible to deport us. So the only way to get rid of us is a systemic system of racial genocide. And that's what they're using. So, so what do you think about people? Because um, a, co a conversation or argument that I have is with you know some Africans or Caribbeans is that they would say that Black Americans don't have any culture, right? Mm -hmm. Or they'll say that racism doesn't exist because I was able to come from my country and I made a you know I was 
able to be successful mm. and provide for my family, y'all just using racism as an excuse, you know, to hold y'all back or whatever the case is. Mm -hmm. well, what's your thoughts on- Well, on number that? one, they're politically ignorant, socially inexperienced. They know very little about the experience of the American African. And they also don't understand racism. Mm. In order for racism to succeed, some blacks must be successful. Mm -hmm. You need a LeBron. You need an Oprah. You need a Tyler Perry. You need a Sean Carter. You need a Beyonce Knowles. You need a Sean Puffy Combs. You need a Robert Johnson. You, you follow? Mm. Why do you need successful black people if you want to destroy our black people? Because in order to brainwash the other ones into believing that your failure is not due to systemic discrimination, is due to the fact that you're not intelligent enough or you're not working hard enough. Mm. Do you see that? Right. So if Dr. Mm -hmm. Umar is a billionaire and you've been trying to get your business off the ground, it ain't popped yet. Yeah, you've been wild. trying to get your corporation off the ground, it ain't popped yet. Mm. You didn't opened up 10 business. They all didn't flop. Mm. You need me as the billionaire to come and say, fellas, it's not your fault. They designed the system to not work in your behalf. Mm. But because I love being rich and I love my proximity to white culture and, and lifestyle, I don't tell you it's not your fault that there's a game set up and there's only going to be a few Dr. Umars. I tell you the problem is yours. Obviously, you didn't do your business plan right. Obviously, the reason why the bank didn't give you the business loan is because you didn't have your numbers right. Your credit wasn't high enough. You see that? Mm -hmm. And so the black millionaire and billionaire class mm -hmm. is one of white supremacy's greatest arguments to defend itself against accusations of racism. Because mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey is not going to indict the system. Mm -hmm. LeBron James is not going to indict the system. Right. You understand right. me? Mm -hmm. Tyler Perry is not going to indict the system because they made their money through the system. And because they're at the top, of black society, they know how powerful white folks really are. Mm -hmm. They know how unfair the game really is. Mm -hmm. They know me being here is a privilege that white people gave me. Yes, I worked hard to get here, mm -hmm. but I would never be here without their help. Right. At the end of the day, all of our black millionaires and billionaires are owned by the white power structure. I don't say that to be disrespectful because I respect LeBron James, mm. right? I appreciate the image of a black man with a black woman with black children who's never been in any trouble right. Entered the league at 17, 18 years old and never had a single scandal. He's a good example of a responsible black man. Right. I like how Jay-Z came from Marcy Projects and now you're a billionaire the legal way. I like what Oprah did coming from nothing at Tennessee State. I like what Tyler Perry did coming from sleeping in his car to being a billionaire to owning the first all black music studio, one of the largest in the country's even white folk go to Tyler Perry Studios to film their movies. Part of Black Panther 2 was filmed at Tyler Perry Studios. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate their rags to riches story. The problem is they can't top it off with a cherry on top. Mm -hmm. And the cherry on top is to look the camera in the eye and say, I made it, but most of my people will never will because the system is not designed for black people to succeed. And this is how they get us. They'll promote a few blacks. Everybody else struggling, everybody mm -hmm. else in poverty, everybody else coming out of prison, but they'll promote a few blacks. And because a few blacks made it, mm -hmm. they're automatically supposed to mean that we are doing better. No other group you could be you could push that on. Because every other group is based on collective group pro progress. Right. Black people, we are totally rooted in selfishness and meism. Mm -hmm. We don't have weism like mm -hmm. the Latinos or weism like the Asians or weism like the Anglo-Saxons or weism like the European Jews. We have meism. And as long as we have meism, mm -hmm. a few successful blacks automatically means y'all all must do better. Like I think I saw Jay-Z do an interview one time and they said, well, what have you done for black people? And he said something to the effect and I don't want to misquote him. I'm paraphrasing. He says something like, me just being who I am. Is enough for black people? Is enough for black people. Okay. Most ridiculous, arrogant, ignorant statement I ever heard. But that's what black millionaires and billionaires feel. Mm. Because I've made it, I'm a benefit to my race. And it's that same ridiculous black bourgeoisie illogical thinking that ushered Barack Obama into the White House, who did nothing for black people but steal everything he worked for and give it to the gays, the immigrants, the Latinos, and white women. A lot of so, people don't... Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, Joe. No, I said, so what do you say about like selective people that selectively black or they want to seem like they support black people. And, you know, black people are like, we're forgiving to everybody, right? We always give opportunity. Except each other. Yeah, exactly. So what do you, how do we handle that? Or should we still be supportive? Or, because we- Give me an example of uh, someone who's selectively black. Give me an example of- Um, 
Damn, uh, right. Like people that like kind of pick and choose. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was saying that as far as like groups, different people. Okay, so like let's bring even a reparation situation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of groups of people like people from Jamaica or people from the Caribbean. They're not black, but now that they're hearing that reparations is a possibility, mm -hmm. they want to be black now. I would argue they are black. Mm -hmm. I would argue they are African. But they're not, in, prior to that, they say I'm not black. You get what I'm saying? I understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't identify with y'all, but when there's a benefit to be obtained, I will. Yes. Temporarily. Yes. Until I get what I need and just roll off the boat. Exactly. Okay. Anyone who is disingenuous about their membership in the African race should be rejected from it. I don't believe in part-time Africans, Africans. I don't believe in <laughs> opportunistically Africans, right? Definitely. Mm. Uh, like what you're speaking of, you know, selective Africans. Yeah. If there's something that I can select that will be a benefit for me, I'll be African for a week, for a day, for a year until I get it, and mm -hmm. then I'm not African no more. I reject all of them. Okay. Whether that's a Jamaican African or an American African. Definitely. Because you got black folks right here mm -hmm. who are the offspring of our enslaved ancestors who don't identify as being black. For me, mm -hmm. blackness is a two-pronged test. Mm -hmm. First of all, are you biologically African Definitely, and are yeah. you psychologically African? So if I look at some of my Puerto Rican African brothers and sisters or some of my Dominican African brothers and sisters, many of them are biologically black, but they do not psychologically identify with the race at all. Definitely. Many do, but more often than not, they don't. Mm -hmm. And so for the ones who do not identify, I don't accept. I don't believe in begging, pleading, or forcing people to be African. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Definitely. Uh, it's an honor to be God's original people. It's an honor to have the strongest DNA. It's an honor to be the oldest people, the most creative people. It's an honor to be who we are. We're Definitely. God's first children. We are the chosen people. Mm -hmm. So I'm not forcing nobody. If you think being ultra light skin is a benefit, run with it. You understand? Mm -hmm. If you think speaking Spanish makes you better than black people speak English, you run with it. Mm -hmm. Or if you're an American Negro like Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who goes out of your way to support the white power structure at the expense of African people, you run with that. You follow mm -hmm. me? Anybody mm -hmm. who wants out, I'm letting them out. Because mm -hmm. the worst thing you can do is force a black person to be black when they don't want to be. Mm -hmm. Because the minute they get a chance to stab you in the back, they're going to do it two times. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So anybody mm -hmm. who don't want to be, you're free to leave. And let's deal with the people who are 100% but 24 people, hours a day if you, unapologetically. And if, if you say this to our aunties, our grandmas, they're going to forgive them. You get what I'm saying? So it's it's like, okay, let them back in. You get what I'm saying? Was, but the issue... But don't you well, think Well, let true? me go back. Let me take a step back. For me, uh, yeah. this should only be one reparations moving anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't support the tribalistic approach to reparations where the American Africans got their own fight, the Caribbean Africans got their own fight, mm -hmm. the continental Africans got their own fight, the Australian Africans got their own fight, the Brazilians got their own fight, Central yeah. American Africans, uh-uh. We all came from one place, mm -hmm. one place, mm -hmm. and it should be one organized system for reparations. The reason we don't have a global approach to reparations is because everybody favors the tribe over the race. And that is why Pan-Africanism is so revolutionary mm -hmm. because we're the only ones to say that being African is more important than being a Jamaican. Being African is more important than being an American African, a descendant of a slave. Being African is more important than being a Brazilian. Mm -hmm. Until you elevate the family, above your nationality, mm -hmm. then we'll never get what we need. You have to have a unified approach for something as important as reparations. And I'm going to be honest with you, and this is something that a lot of us are not looking at globally or locally, and that is what we are demanding for reparations, you normally only get through an act of war. If we get all that we are entitled to, it'll be the first time in human history that one group of people received from their oppressors that type of a settlement that type of a resolution without no bloodshed. People go to war mm. for less than what we're owed in reparations. Mm. And I'm going to be honest with you. I believe it's going to take war for us to get it. But so mm. what about... They will give you reparations, but it will not be anything near what you were entitled to. Because I'm familiar that. with the U.S. paying, obviously, the Native Americans. The Japanese. Um, the Japanese. The European the Euro Jews. The, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of those And they give reparations to people who they haven't even harmed, like the Afghanis, the Ukrainians, right. mm -hmm. and everybody else. Right. So, you know, how should reparations be paid? And, you know, why do you think that, you know, because there was a poll recently where they asked, you know, non-black, 
you know, Americans or just non-black people if black people deserve reparations and overwhelmingly mm-hmm. they said no. So why do you think that non-black no. people said, non-black these, are, these are non-black people, you know? When yeah, they, non-black they people. Them, you know, why do you think they don't think that black Americans deserve reparations? And how would you go about um, giving reparations to black Americans? Good question. First of all, why does the opinion of an Asian matter at all? Mm. You are not an enslaver. You are not an enslaved. Mm. You understand me? Why, what does the opinion of someone who had nothing to do with my tragedy, <laughs> why does their opinion even matter? I'll tell you why it matters. America wants to create this illusion of a multicultural society where race don't matter. And America knows because everybody wants to be here so badly, they don't have a problem shitting on black people to improve their relationship with the white power structure. So if you ask the Asian, do black people deserve reparations? Of course not. You ask the Arab, do black people deserve reparations? Of course not. You ask the European Jew, who got reparations? Mm. Do black people deserve reparations? Of course not. But we should not be surprised. If I don't value black life, Mm-hmm. Why the hell would I care about you receiving compensation for unpaid labor damages and harm? They don't value African life. Mm-hmm. So of course they don't give a damn about you getting no reparations. You understand me? Right. Because they're not coming, they're not approaching this question from an issue of justice or perspective of justice or equality. They're approaching this question from a perspective of racism, bigotry, bias. And, and discrimination. Right. Nobody wants black people to get anything because they want to take your place. You understand me? The Asian don't want you doing better than them in America. Mm-hmm. You understand? The Arab don't want you doing better than them in America. The European Jew don't want you doing better than them in America. The Latinos don't want you doing better than them in America. So, of course, if somebody put a microphone in their mouth and say, should black people get something that you're not going to get, why would they say yes? They prefer us to be a punching bag. Absolutely. And my question is, what? it's none of your business. All right. This is an issue between black people and white people. What the Chinese man thinks is irrelevant. What the Latino thinks is irrelevant. Mm-hmm. What the European Jew thinks is irrelevant. What the Arab thinks is irrelevant. You're not the enslaved or the enslaver. Who the hell cares what you think about it? Mm-hmm. But because we're so multicultural, the power structure can use those non-black opinions against us. Uh-huh. Because they can say, since you see the Latino as your brother and sister, since you see the Arab as your brother and sister, and we are all Americans, because black people, love to, they love that Americanism, right. which is another reason why we're not going to get reparations, because the white man knows you would rather be an American and get reparations. If you got to choose between the two, most black people want that red, white, and blue flag more than anything else, right? And so as a result of that, the power structure can then say, since you consider yourself to be a part of the family of America, most of us don't think y'all should get reparations. So why don't we put it on the next federal election and see how many Americans think black people should get reparations? And then they could just block out the whole thing and say, most Americans don't think this is a good thing for the country. Mm. You see? And you know how they were able to do that? Because we started identifying with this country more than ourselves. We should have never bought into this American citizenship garbage. We should have never allowed that. Just like we should have never bought into people of color. We should never should have never bought into minority. We should never bought into uh, disadvantaged communities. All of these are labels Umbrella terms, that clump yeah. you in with all non-white people mm. that allows the government to take care of their needs and never take care of yours. Right. And nobody even see you not being taken care of because guess what? Your issues are being smothered by Arab issues, Latino issues, Chinese issues, homosexual issues. So nobody even realized black people still suffering because you allowed yourself to be defined and such a way that other groups were included with you. Mm. That's the worst thing you can do as a people with such a unique history as we have in this country. We have to stand up and stand out like a sore thumb. But Mm. because most black people have been brainwashed by church, that being race first is a sin, right? Mm -hmm. And and because most black people have a low racial self-esteem problem, the last thing they want to do is stick out. We are too neurotic about being black. We are too insecure about being black. We are too anxious about being black. We don't want to stick out. We want to blend in. And that's how that multicultural weapon was used against us. what about, because, you know, right now when we're having this conversations, there's a lot of words being interchanged. We got we got African Americans, we got blacks, you know. So some people would say that black Americans have an identity crisis. We don't know if we want to identify as black. We don't know if we want to be African American. We got FBA. We got Moors. We got all these different True. terms to describe black um, indigenous slaves. Or You get what I'm saying? So do you think that black people in America have an identity crisis? I think most black people in the world have an identity crisis. You got to remember, when a white man went into the Caribbean, if you were a British subject, you may have called yourself British. If you went into French West Africa, 
there are Africans who might still consider themselves subjects of the French Empire. Mm. You understand me? <laughs> Most Africans globally have an identity crisis because we have been conquered by white people. Mm. Remember, only once upon a time, the only independent country you had on the face of this earth that was black was Ethiopia. That's the only free black country on the face of the earth at one time. And we were forced to do what? Speak out, excuse me, speak our oppressor's language, right. wear his clothes, mm -hmm. worship through his religion, mm -hmm. and identify with his flag. Right. So we all had, and many of us still have, an identity crisis. Now, as far as all the different ideologies and political ideologies, here's what I say to that. I don't give it a lot of attention because I think most black people know they're from Africa. Right. Mm -hmm. So when people lie and say you're not from Africa, you're a Cherokee or a Choctaw, this or that, most black people have enough common sense and command of the history to know where they came from. I mean, you have DNA analysis now. We don't even have to debate this philosophically. We can find out genetically. Give some blood and let's see if the Cherokee Nation comes up on the damn paperwork. <laughs> you understand me? It's not going to come up because you're an African. Right. But again, nobody wants to be on a losing team. So look at the contradiction. We'll get mad at a Jamaican African brother or sister who doesn't identify with us. We'll get mad at an immigrant Nigerian African brother or sister who don't want to identify with us. But you got American Africans right here mm -hmm. who will tell you they're not African. Mm -hmm. I'm a That's Cherokee. Crazy. I'm a Native American. I'm an alien. I'm a this, I'm a that. <laughs> and we don't say nothing to them. You see? So, so, so how is them not wanting to be an American African any different than a homegrown American African mm -hmm. telling you I ain't African? You see what I'm saying? I get you saying. The harm is equal. So why separate it? See, as, as, as Pan-African as we don't see, there's really no differences. Mm. The same isms and schisms and self-hate that we have in America, they have it in Africa. They have it in the Caribbean. There's Jamaicans who will tell you they're not from Africa. Mm. They got what, you know, over in there, they don't really... They have racism, obviously, but since the majority of the continent is black people, they don't... They, could, they have a whole thing called xenophobia now, like, you know, where you discriminate... Um, from another African because they live in a different country. Like, you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so. They do, but a lot of the xenophobia, and it's not justifiable, mm -hmm. but a lot of the xenophobia is economically related because what happens is you live in South Africa. Right. He lives in Namibia, hypothetically. Right. It's the classes you mean? As no, a, no, stay with me. Yeah. So you are boycotting your job because y'all want higher pay. So they come to Namibia and tell you, get me 100 Namibians, come to South Africa, we need y'all to break this protest. Mm -hmm. You hungry. You got kids to feed, so guess what you do? You come across national lines and you break the South African protest. Now you just gave birth to that xenophobia. Why would you bring your black ass to my country and sabotage my fight right. for better pay? You see that? Okay. So a lot of the xenophobia in Africa is economically related. It's the white man, again, mm -hmm. putting black mm -hmm. people I against black people. It's mm -hmm. the same thing they do over here with us. It's no different. Right. So which which division you think is more important to fix first? The division here in the U.S. or the, the division in Africa? It's always global because we do not live in a isolated box. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem when people say you got to take care of the African-American thing first. Yeah. That's ridiculous uh -huh. because you may never take care of the African-American thing. So the whole African world goes to hell mm. because we didn't fix this first? Uh-uh. And you'll find that you can actually do a better job of fixing local issues when you tap into the global issues because you're cutting yourself off from ideas. You're cutting yourself off from strategies. You're cutting yourself off for resources that could be put in play locally. And, and the thing that I always get with people, why can't you do two things at once? Can't you carry water over here and still carry a cake over here? When you're driving your car, ain't you staying with your arms and mm -hmm. using the gas and the brake with your foot? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Why only when we deal with politics and black solutions mm -hmm. do people say you can only do one thing at a time? You can do both. Yeah. Every Pan-Africanist in history mm -hmm. has done both. We focus on the global unity of the race mm -hmm. while we attack our domestic problem. The most honorable Marcus Garvey from right here in New York City was more instrumental in a lot of the changes that came to black people in New York City than local black elected officials. And he was a Pan-Africanist. Mm. So people have this perception that Pan-Africanists only care about the global agenda. Yes, the global agenda is king. You damn right. But my local issues matter just as much. Mm. Because if I'm trying to organize people to join the global fight, what better way to do that than to show and prove where I am? You understand? Right. Mm. I'm a Pan-Africanist, but name me a school psychologist who puts some more work for our kids than me right here in America. Nobody. Right. Historically, there's no psychologist who's ever done for black people what I've done for black people as it relates to training parents and making sure they can protect their children. I'm, I'm the greatest in that area, mm. but I'm still a Pan-Africanist. Why can't I do two things at once? Right. I'm going to Johannesburg next month, Ethiopia next month, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, 
I could still be in the streets of Philadelphia protesting. I could still be in New York handling what I got to do. You follow what I'm saying? Right. Mm. Our problems are multi-systemic, and the solutions must be multimodal as well. Mm. We just can't put all eggs in one basket and wait for that basket to sell before we get another basket. That's ridiculous. You're working on something while he's working on something, while you're working on something, while I'm working on something, while he's working on something. Mm. There is no one 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 problem at a time. Mm. That's ridiculous. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what would be your solution to reparations and how should that be? Um, well, for me, a couple things. Number one, the psychological cost of reparations has not been effectively quantified yet. That's being left out of the conversation. Mm. You can get more for psychological damage than you could get for unpaid labor. You feel me? Mm -hmm. 246 years of unpaid labor, that's nothing compared to the psychological terrorism that white people has reaped on our ancestors. That's right. in our True. soul, in our DNA, in our blood. Right. I don't hear enough people talking about the psychological cost. That's your biggest pay mm -hmm. right there. And when I say pay, I don't say cash because I think cash payment is a trap. I don't have a problem with cash being on the list, but it should not be primary, especially now, right. because you have BRICS, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, right. who are about to float their own currency. They're going to tie it to the gold reserves in, in, in their countries, and that's going to drop the value of yeah, the dollar. dollar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the U.S. dollar is about to plummet, why in the hell would you accept payment for your ancestors' dehumanization worth shit. through mm -hmm. a worthless American dollar. Right. Yeah. Money is a trap. But all these thirsty reparations people, all they want is some money. I mean, let's just be honest. Half the people talking about reparations just want to check. Yeah. They have no vision for changing nothing for black America. They have no history of grassroots struggle. They're YouTube and opportunists, most of them. They're not deep thinkers. I don't honestly don't think black people would be financially um, responsible enough to you know, use that money. I think we just going to get that money right back. That's oh, we are. Cars yeah. and chain. We are. Cars and chain. Which is Go another ahead. issue that I have with our approach to reparations. Mm. Mm. When did we come together and choose people to represent us in this conversation and in this negotiation? Who is it, though? People are self-selecting themselves. You know why? Because we are disorganized. Mm. So before there's any reparations conversation, before yeah. there's any before there's any distribution of reparations, mm -hmm. we have to first organize and elect the people mm -hmm. we want to represent us. You just can't have somebody on YouTube popping up, I'm the face, <laughs> I'm the face. That's why black America always gets exploited. Definitely. Because we are disorganized, anybody can claim to be the leader. Mm -hmm. You can go out here right now and say you're the leader of black America, and guess what? Nobody's probably going to oppose you because we are so disorganized organized mm -hmm. and a disorganized people are ripe for opportunists. Opportunists love disorganization because it gives you the right to do anything and not be held accountable for it. So number one, we need to be organized. Right. And until we get organized, there should be no conversation on reparation. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to tell you what the white man going to do. We already know what he going to do. He going to look for people he can use. Mm -hmm. And he's going to give the reparations to them, mm -hmm. and he's going to dictate how they use the reparations. Mm -hmm. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. So he's not sweating this. He mm -hmm. said, okay, this is how y'all want to handle this? Mm -hmm. No organization, no conversation. Mm -hmm. Just a few, okay, well, let me select him because I know I own him. Mm -hmm. And let me select him. I know I own him. And y'all going to use this money just for basketball and football. You, you understand me? Right. It, it, it'll be a joke. Right. A disorganized people should never go to war with an organized people. Right, that's fair. There has never been a war in history where a disorganized group of people won against an organized group of people. Show me where. Mm. We can't, and reparations will be no different. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you need an infrastructure to catch the reparations, right. to make sure that the black dollar circulates several times before it leaves your community. Right. Mm -hmm. The black dollar leaves our community in less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So if you accept a cash payout, all you did was serve as a middleman between the Federal Reserve and every thirsty merchant in the black community raping us financially. Mm -hmm. Because every penny you get from reparations is going to go to the China man, mm -hmm. to the A-Rab, A -Rab, to the yeah. Jew. Yep. Mm -hmm. you go, it's going to Mercedes. It's going to Nike. Mm -hmm. And then black people say, you don't know that that's true. Yes, I do know that that's true. You know why? Because as a psychologist, the best predictor of future behavior is current behavior. Right. And so you, you mean to tell me we're going to, rad power we're going to radically change our spending habits? Mm -hmm. With the reparations money? Yeah, it's not going to happen. When you've never been responsible with your own damn money? Mm -hmm. What happened to all the stimulus checks Black America got? What do we do with that for the people? <laughs> what about our tax returns? What do we do with that for the people? Yeah, what right have back. we done since yeah. Dr. King's murder 55 years ago financially and collectively to transform our reality? Nothing at all. Mm. And that's why I've said I do not believe that the current generation of African people mm. should be responsible for the dissemination or discussion over reparations because we haven't done anything worthwhile that will entitle us to that type of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right? So we should get our land back. 
all the land that was confiscated from African people between the end of slavery and the end of Reconstruction. Mm. You're talking about tens of thousands of acres. All the land got to come back. Mm. All of the inventions that black people invented, everything from the gas mask to the stoplight, refrigerated truck, the golf tee, the ironing board, all of that mm. reverts back to us as a permanent patent. And whenever you use it, we got to license it to you. We get paid for it. Mm. Black music, all black music, only black people. One of the biggest reparations settlements we can have. Only black people can own, sell, publish, promote, or perform black music. Mm. That's big, right? That's a, yeah. Black music is one of America's top exports. Right. This country makes more money off selling black talent than almost anything else she sells. Mm. If we owned Michael Jackson's catalog, Sam Cooke's catalog, the Beatles catalog, think about that. Prince catalog. Yeah. Prince catalog, mm. all of them. We have enough money to build a black Wall Street in every city. We got to get the music. Any reparations package that does not give us exclusive control of our music, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. is a loss. Mm. Because black music is too powerful, too globally influential, right. and brings in too much revenue right. for us not to control the music. Would you? Or are you referring to like the past music or current? Past and current? present. Past and present. Yeah. You think in other words, possible? Sony Records, mm. Warner Brothers, Universal, mm. you've made billions of dollars True. off those catalogs. Mm -hmm. Pass them on over now. Do you feel me? Yeah. They've made more than enough money mm. off of our deceased artists. Right. You understand me? More than their families made. Mm. It's time to revert, revert them on back. Mm -hmm. What you think? And we can't let nobody trivialize that because this is how you going to just take it back? The yeah. same way white people went into Palestine and took land from the Palestinians and gave the Israelis, the European Jews, a country of their own. But that go back to the war, the war thing. Like they they shed blood for that. They went yeah. over there with um, organized. You know what I mean? And was able to assert But themselves. that was an act of the global white power structure. The European right. Jews themselves didn't go over there and wage war. Okay. The U.S. and Britain, they did that. And the reason they did that is they wanted to have a satellite country amongst the Middle Eastern nations that they could use as a spy in a military base in case they need to go to war with Iran or Iraq. Mm -hmm. In other words, it benefited America and the U.K. to have Israel right here amongst the Arabs. So if we need to go to war, we can launch from right, right here. here. They right. was looking out for themselves, really. Always. You see. What but in, it, also, in addition to that, America's natural resources, America has like 10 major natural resources. Mm -hmm. We should get a 25% cut of the revenue of all those natural resources into perpetuity, permanently, forever. You what follow about tax me? exemption? Should that be on the table as well? I'm not against it. Okay. It's not the most important thing, though. All right. Because if you're economically empowered, you really don't care what your taxes are. We have to think like, like Native well, Americans, we, that, don't they get like a, aren't they like exempt from taxes and stuff? Who like is? That? Native Americans. I'm not sure. They might be. I think, they I think that was part of the... I'm not against it. Right. Yeah. But I don't... When, when, when you think of a reparation settlement, yeah. the whole purpose of the settlement is to empower your people. Right. Yeah. Right? There's no billionaire in America who's fighting for a tax exemption because he's making enough money to pay them. Are y'all following me? Mm -hmm. We got to oh, make they sure... they find loopholes in the system where they, they don't... They find loopholes pay. to pay less. I agree with right. that. Yeah. But they're not going to sleep worrying about their tax bill. Jay-Z and Tyler Perry are not losing sleep over their tax bill mm -hmm. because they're wealthy. We have to make sure that we don't approach reparations, which is supposed to be an empowerment vehicle for African peoples with a poverty mindset. Mm -hmm. You follow me? It's like if somebody said black people should never have to pay to park on the street again. Who the fuck cares? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel yeah, me? That if is, you got yeah. enough revenue coming yeah. in, yeah. who cares about that? Right. Mm -hmm. If we have to be concerned about a tax exemption, mm. then you're automatically telling me that whatever we're getting for reparations Ancient. isn't enough to sustain our families. You feel me? Yeah. If we got to be concerned about a tax exemption, yeah. whatever we got on that reparations list is not enough to sustain us. Mm. Because if you still got the hide from your taxes, you're not making enough money. You feel me? That's right. So that means we got to go back to the drawing board. So, so with these big companies controlling like the politicians, mm -hmm. how likely you think it is for us to get our music back from these big companies? Like, you know? Well, remember, your negotiations are with the government. Uh -huh. So it's the government that got to go to the Jewish corporations that own our music mm -hmm. and say, this goes to them now. Mm -hmm. We don't care if y'all like it or not. And you know why the Jewish uh, music companies can't say nothing about it? Uh -huh. Because they participated in our slavery too. So they couldn't say, uh -huh. well, you know, this was just business. Yeah. No. Y'all financed the slave ships. You were the ones who paid the slave masters for slaves who showed up deceased or missing an arm or missing a leg or the ones who committed suicide. Mm -hmm. European Jewish companies were the biggest financiers and insurers of the slave voyages. Mm -hmm. They were also slave owners, okay? The, uh, 
I ain't gonna, Secretary you, you, of you, you War. You're ordering anti-Semitism. That's what they're going to say No, no, no. Right this now, is like, truth. Yeah. Anti-falsehood. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of War for the Confederacy, I believe, was mm -hmm. a European Jew. He owned over 100 slaves, I believe. So that's not a, enough bloodshed? You get what I'm saying? You know, the, the time of slavery, all the black people that died, mm -hmm. that's not enough bloodshed for, for us to get reparations the right way. Of course it is, but here's the problem. Here is the problem. You were enslaved to give white people an eternal advantage over everyone else in the world, economically and politically, including you. With reparations, you're asking this white man to undo, mm -hmm. repair reparations. You're asking him to undo the unfair advantage he spent the last 500 years building for himself. Right. And that's why I'm going to go back to my earlier point. I don't think we get reparations without war. Mm. People have went to war for less mm. than what we are entitled to. Mm. And here's the big question you got to ask yourself. Because from, from a Garvey perspective, it's all about power. It ain't about equality. It ain't about justice. It ain't about Jesus. It ain't about voting. It ain't about being an American. It ain't about equity. You know what it's about? The power you have to force the white man to do what he don't want to do. And here's my question. What are black people going to do if the white man gets on television right now and say, I'm not getting anything for reparations. We took a poll and most Americans don't feel it's necessary. Enjoy the rest of your week. Tear up their own community. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We're going to protest and tear up our own communities. And, uh -huh. and the very next day, mm -hmm. you'll be having lunch and cheese with the same white folks who said you don't deserve reparations. Mm. That's the sad part. Do you feel me? You have to understand something. We haven't had a comprehensive, sustained movement for systemic change in this country since Dr. King. No matter what people may say or think about Dr. King, he was the last leader to give us a real movement. Mm. Nobody has given you a movement since Dr. King. Mm. You've had your Million Man marches for one day. You've had your Al Sharpton rallies for one day. You had your Jesse Jackson get-togethers for one day. But you have not had a movement, not a sustainable one, not a comprehensive one. The last time was Dr. King. Mm. The point that I'm making, black people are politically lazy and white people know it. That's why I find it hard for you know us to be patriotic for a, for a place that doesn't love or care for but us But we back. are the most patriotic. Yeah, that's what I'm and saying. And you know why we're the most be. patriotic? Because we're the most psychologically homeless. Black people are very neurotic about their identity. Mm. We hate Africa, where we come from. We cling to America. We will go around the world and brag about being an American, although you enjoy almost no rights. Immigrants who are not even citizens have more rights than you. Mm. You have Ukrainians right now getting Social Security checks, free housing, free medical care, free education but you have the highest black homelessness rate since the 1960s. How you got Ukrainians who not even citizens living better than black people who built the country? Mm. And the reason it's so difficult for us to change that is black people care more about the American citizenship than they do about justice. Mm. The minute you bring up, maybe we should disidentify as American citizens. It's certainly an option. It's certainly an option. Mm. You have a whole refugee law in the United Nations that would allow us to say, we're not being treated like Americans. We no longer identify as Americans. We are Africans in exile or whatever name we want to give ourselves. But we are definitely not Americans and we are protected by the United Nations under their refugee laws and their anti-genocide conventions. Mm. We would get more rights as refugees in this country than we do as so-called American citizens. I mean, everybody else have their even the location. They got Little Italy, Chinatown. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no place No for Little them. Africa. Nowhere mm -hmm. in this country where you go yeah. where black people own the school, the hospital, the bank, and the supermarket. Facts. Mm -hmm. Four major institutions, not to mention manufacturing and distribution. Mm -hmm. But we are $2 trillion a year. Mm -hmm. $2 trillion a year. No institutions... Half your HBCUs are supposed to be closed in the next 30 years. God forbid that doesn't happen. Like but you want in, in more money. Like but you want more money to do what exactly? You mean to tell me you can't spend the $2 trillion you got responsibly? Mm -hmm. But now you want the ancestors' money so you can splurge that too. Uh-uh. Yeah, if, I, if, I, if I had a vote, I'd vote no. That money, none of it, none of the restitution package gets disseminated amongst black America until black America organizes itself and begins to act responsibly. I would say this, build the institutions with the two trillion that you got. And once you build the institutions, then you get the reparations.
Think, Prove yeah. that you can handle this. Mm. Prove you are responsible enough to deal with these reparations. Build some institutions. Mm. Until we get those five major institutions in 20 major black cities, no reparations should be disseminated because we're going to do nothing but waste it and give it back to non blacks. Mm -hmm. that, mm. That's fair. Listen, let me get to this next topic. Um, you, you know, Dr. Umar, I had a lot of conversations with people about this topic, a lot of heated debates. Um, people want to know can you be pro black? and date outside your race. Absolutely and I, and, not. And I got my good brother right here, you know, who's an advocate, and he says that you can be pro-black and date outside. Impossible. Race. You cannot. Marriage is a business. When you get married, you commit your mind, your body, your body, your heart, your soul, mm. and your pocketbook, mm. your savings, your estate, your wealth. You commit that to that person you're married to. See, when you marry, you don't marry an individual. You marry into a race. You marry into a community. So I didn't just, I didn't marry a Jewish woman. I married into Jewish society. I didn't marry an Asian woman. I married into an Asian family. There's no way you can claim to love black people, especially as a black man, knowing that only one out of every four black women will get married in her lifetime. We have the lowest female marriage rate in the country. 25%. That means 75% of black women will never ever know what it feels like to be proposed to. And if you care about the black community, you got to care about saving the black family because the family is the essential institution of a community. And the only way you can save a family is to build a family. You can only build a family with a black woman. Absolutely not. You cannot talk black and sleep white. And why would the original man mm. want a member of the race that enslaved and dehumanized you to carry your seed. Why would I, after the rape and the lynching and the slavery and the <laughs> Willie Lynch and the Jim Crow and the police brutality and the economic apartheid we need and the gentrification mm -hmm. and the AIDS and the Ebola, the West Nile, the COVID, mm -hmm. the genetics, the eugenics, why would I want to take my original seed mm -hmm. God's seed mm -hmm. and put it in a cave-dwelling organism. Why would I want to do that? Go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we need to hear you, bro. The, the, mic, is, the mic is yours, Ace. Yeah. <laughs> I want to incubate my son, my daughter, in the womb of the people mm -hmm. who have destroyed mm -hmm. my people in this world. Now let me let me say first when I when I made this argument I wasn't necessarily talking about white women obviously now, I mean there's other races out there but and they um, hate you just as much <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying all right so you you said yourself earlier mm -hmm. that there are black people among us that are not for us true true so with that being said there are people of other races that are more for us than there are our people describe for us please. When you go to protests for for black rights and um, p police brutality and stuff, and you see other races that are out there that and there are black people that would never be caught out there. You know what I mean, okay. Uh -huh. So because an I'm, I'm just uh, I go ahead. or a Caucasian uh -huh. showed up for a George Floyd march, right? That means they give a shit about black people. I'm just saying. Let me ask you this: <laughs> Accur according to the Pew Research. Uh -huh. They said one in five protesters mm. during the George Floyd protest was black. Okay. Four out of five were non-black. Right. At least three out of the four were white. So the yeah. George Floyd protests were mostly white people. Okay. If white people care that much about black folks, no changes. why didn't that woman <laughs> who got Emmett Till murdered why was she never arrested? She, still, if white people care that much about black life, why all these police mm. that's going around killing black folks are not being held accountable? Mm. If white people care that much about black life, why don't we see it in the political and economic realities of black people? Facts. You know why they showed up to the George Floyd march? Why? To dissipate the power of black people mm -hmm. and to redirect the focus of those marches. White people outnumber black people five to one. Mm. So if you let them in, they automatically take control by virtue of their numbers mm. and redirect it. And so Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party turned the George Floyd march mm. into a damn mm. celebration for yeah. Joe Biden. Joe Biden votes in the Democratic Party. Mm. We got nothing out the march whatsoever because we let it get diluted. Right. You have to keep it all black. The minute you let white people in, because you can't control how many join. 
Mm -hmm. There's more of them than us here. You can't control how many join. So the minute you let them in, they now have the power to remake this into whatever they want. And because most Negroes who participated in the George Floyd March made it multicultural, mm -hmm. every time we get on the microphone, this is not just about black people. I'm so tired of hearing that shit. Mm. It is, though. Everywhere it is you about go, us. It is yeah, about yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But if you notice, when it's about us, it can't be about us. Mm. Yeah. It can't just See, be about when, us. when the Mexicans shut down the highways in California, mm. nobody tried to multiculturalize that. Mm -hmm. You understand me? You're not welcome here. And absolutely. This is our thing. <laughs> yeah. When the European Jews, this is our thing. Yeah. But soon when black people do it, we got to multiculturalize to do what? Kill the focus of it. Holding hands Nobody wants black people to be crazy. free, and they damn sure don't want you to be equal, and they definitely don't want you to have more than they do. So let me let me help my good brother out, right? So some of the talking points when I do have these conversations with other black men or black women is that, you know... Procreating is part of being pro-black, right? Co-creating with another mm -hmm. black person. So Wait, some people will we, say. Before we get into that, okay, what will be your description of a pro-black person? I hate the term pro-black. Okay, because I never heard of a pro-Mexican, a pro-Jew. This right. is how messed uh -huh. up we are. Uh -huh. Not you for saying pro-black, mm. but for you to have to define a black person as pro-black. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? Right. That automatically means by contraindication that most black people mm. are anti-black. That's a fact. Do you feel me? Mm -hmm. If I got, if I walk and you say he's pro-black, because this is what people say when they see me, mm -hmm. he, it'll be a thousand blacks. He's pro-black. Do you know what you're saying about everybody else in here? Nah, no, Jay. They're fucking coons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. We're the only people where the people who are for us mm. are the minority. Mm. Think about that. But you have so to describe people who care about black people as pro-black. No other group has to do that. I don't, and I don't, it speaks to how that, much most of us are anti-ourselves. I don't necessarily think that means you're like you're anti-black because usually when I think of the word pro, usually is the most extreme of something, right? This is why we have pro-life and everything else. When you put pro in front of something, that means the most extreme. I think... People confuse being proud to be black with being pro-black. I think people are proud to be think, black. I don't I don't I don't see how one could exist without the other. What? If um, I'm proud to be black, mm -hmm. I'm pro-black. I'm for my people. Yeah, but some people might say, like when you look up the definition, it might say only supporting black owned businesses or only to support yeah, they, they everything the all black. So when you say pro is the most extreme. I'm only buying from black people. I'm only reproducing. I'm only loving black people. It I'm would only... be impossible yeah, yeah, to only to buy from black people because we don't manufacture and sell yeah, everything that, that somebody yeah. needs in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, pro black means always putting the best interests of my people first in any situation or any decision that I have to make. Okay. You, you follow what I'm saying? You ain't got to be super this, you ain't got to be a black superhero, right. <laughs> but I'm going to put my people's interests above anything else in front, above the church, above the mosque, and above other minority groups. My people come first. That's all it means to me. Mm. And you ain't got to be extreme with it. You understand me? So people see me, when I walk out on the streets, white people are stopping talk. A raps to stop and talk. I got people follow my work of every race, mm. and I will respect them as human beings. Yeah. But when it comes to the struggle, none of your interests matter before my own people, because my people's interests will never matter mm. before yours.